Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk, everyone. Um, Today, this topic is so near and dear to my heart. And I have always been an animal lover. I've always had pets. I've always, um, you know, rescued animals, you know, pick up a bird from the side of the street. And uh, one of the topics that I hear so frequently from my peers is, can I have my animal when I have a transplant or with kidney disease? And, And I often hear that doctors tell their patients they got to get rid of all their animals to get transplanted. And that just makes me like sense shivers up my spine because that would just reduce all my will to live if I had to give up my furry friends who I love so much. So today I'm very excited because we have Dr. Rafael Villacana. He's a medical director of Loma Linda University Transplant Program Medical Center. I think I got that right. Is that correct, Dr. Villacana? Yes, you did. Lots of words. I know. I know. It's a mouthful. And uh, what I want to say um, about Dr. Villacana is he was uh, one of the doctors who cared for me during my uh, fourth transplant. And I have to say, I had a lot of animals, and I had to go through the desensitization protocol. And we really worked out what was a good strategy for me to keep all my animals and live happily ever after. And I just respect him so much for really bringing up that topic and and making everybody feel comfortable, my healthcare team, that I wasn't at risk for any kind of um, complication due to my pets. So welcome to the show, Dr. Viacana. Thanks, Lori. It's good to be back. So, you know, tell me a little bit. I mean, we share this love for animals. So tell me a little bit about the first memory of you having animals that you love, because I think that's so important. We both love animals. No, absolutely. So just a quick disclaimer for the audience. Um, I am biased because I'm a son of a vet- veterinarian. I think you knew that. So um, obviously from the very uh, young age, I was exposed to uh, animals at home and um that is kind of what I'm used to, and I think many of us are, um, many of your listeners as well. So, obviously, from very early on, we used to have at least two to three um, uh, pets at a time, uh, mainly uh, pets that were abandoned and uh, without um, someone to care for them. So that's kind of what uh, what has happened over the years and con- continues to be the case today. <laughs> I know. We always got to rescue animals and try to educate people about it. So uh, tell us a little bit about your, um, you know, you see a lot of transplant patients and um, tell us, you know, some of the things, you know, can you have an animal when you have a transplant? I guess that's the big question. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a big question and um, it comes up quite a bit. And as you mentioned earlier, I mean, there's there's uh, quite a variation in terms of recommendations on, on whether you should or shouldn't, and if so, what kind of animal. But uh, the, the overall answer is yes, one could um, have an animal or, or a pet uh, after a uh, transplant. There are some precautions to take that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. So mostly we're talking about dogs, cats, and then you have like farm animals. But I think we're really going to just speak about just you know, dogs, cats, birds, rabbits, stuff like that that you have in the house, um, hamsters, stuff like that, um, not to go into other types of animals because just for the nature of pets. So what are the first things that, you know, if you're somebody who's going to get a transplant, you need to probably bring the discussion up, not the day of the transplant, right? <laughs> like, oh, I have pets at home. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it'd, be, it'd be way better to talk about it early. Um, cause I, I definitely don't want to have anyone overreact and think that we're going to say something in reality we don't. So I, I would hate for someone to have to, uh, let go of a, of a pet or an animal, uh, basically a family member or give them to someone else or put them up for adoption when in reality that was not necessary. So you're right. It's better to talk about it sooner than later. Well, and the worst option, which just makes me crazy, is they take it to the shelter. And, you know, the outlook is not so great for animals right now because there's such an overpopulation, unfortunately. So adopt, don't shop. That's my commercial. 
why don't we walk it through? I'm a I'm a patient that's seeing you, and I have a dog. I have this is a real case scenario, <laughs> or I'm asking for a friend. Okay, uh, I have four dogs, a cat, and a parrot, <laughs> and I want to get transplanted. So what do I do, and how do I protect myself? So the first thing that, that you do is you realize that you don't have to let them go. You get to keep your your animals. So that's the good news. Um, the general precautions will be especially more for birds, uh, reptiles. Those are probably the maybe the the riskier, if you will, uh, animals to have around the home. And uh, basically, just general precautions: washing your hands. Uh, try not to, uh, at least for the case for for birds, to change their or get into their cage um, at least early on. Remember, the first um, three to six months, your immune system is going to be very um, depressed pretty low, so your, your um, risk of infection will be the greatest during that time period. Well, you know, I want to just jump in on the bird a little bit, because I had my third transplant in 1990, and I wasn't really educated. I fell in love with this little African gray parrot that was three months old. Oh, Johnny. And I, Johnny, Johnny. I mean, he writes a Christmas card every year, you know? He's so talented. And, um, you know, he's going to be 28, and I didn't know that birds were an issue, but, um, you know, his cage is always clean. He's always clean. You know, he's not been around other birds. And I have i didn't know it was a risk factor until somebody said, you can't have an African gray. And I'm like, well, I've had him for 10 years. Um, you know, uh, what, you want me to get rid of my bird? But I think I did all the things that you were supposed to do with the bird. And I'm so glad I have him because he just adds so much joy to everybody's life. Our whole neighborhood, you know, our whole neighborhood. Put Johnny out so we can hear him talk. So That's right, um, I've met Johnny. I agree. <laughs> He's very talented. Uh, he might be taking over for me one day. So um, yes, no, but I guess you're right. You, you did all the right things and c- continue to do so. So I, obviously, that's why you haven't had any issues. But um, but historically, birds um, have been associated with a little bit more increased risk of, of infection. Um, reptiles uh, as well. Kind of to more common um, animals. Um, we'll, we'll start with dogs. Uh, dogs have uh, there's always a risk uh, like anything but uh, fairly low risk um just uh, common sense uh, wash your hands uh, before and after you you handle your uh, your pets and then try if you could uh, avoid having to um handle their their waste and if so uh, wear gloves things like that well and i think one of the big thing is is just keeping your dog clean I mean, you know, you wash your dog and, you know, you make sure that they're, and we have, um, well, we we have three dogs right now, but I have all poodle mixes. So um, the only hair that I have around my house is from the cat. So the dogs, I actually have to get groomed because they grow out. So, uh, because a lot of people don't know this, but poodle mixes have hair instead of fur. So um, they don't shed like um, every dog. And, and that's what we've done. We've just kept them really clean. We keep them vaccinated. We put flea and tick um, medicine on them so they don't bring, a- and just watch them for anything that may look like they're sick. And, you know, I've never had a problem getting sick from a dog. <laughs> so that's correct. Um, like, like you mentioned, uh, I, I hit on taking precautions yourself, but, but you're right. If you uh, maintain good health for your uh, pet, that, that, that goes a long way. Just uh, one last thought on, on dogs. Puppies, though, do confer a little bit higher risk of infection um, because their immune system is, is kind of, uh, you know, obviously new. They maybe not have been vaccinated yet. So I do recommend if you're thinking about getting a brand new puppy, maybe to hold off on that uh, a little bit uh, until after transplant. Until you're you're about a year out or something like that. Would that yes, be Yes, I think that would be a good idea, if possible. Then, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit. Um, I had an incident where I was bit by a dog um, in a hotel lobby. The dog was scared. And I guess I smelled like dog. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> you know, it was quite traumatic because, uh, and I think we should just maybe mention that because, um, you know, I got the health of the dog. I had a tetanus shot, I got it cleaned, and I was fine. But um, you have to jump on anything like that very, very quickly if you were to be um, accidentally bit or something like that or have a puncture wound from a dog. No, absolutely. Um, obviously, uh, tending to yourself right away is key. You did all the, the right things, getting the history of the dog, making sure your um, tetanus is up to date. But uh, in general, um, it's very, very rare You know, in 15 years 
that I can, I can think of someone uh, getting sick from a um, dog bite is very rare because of the precautions that you mentioned that you, that you took. Well, yeah, and I always carry like um, little antimicrobial cream and, and Band-Aids, and I just do that if I scratch myself on anything when I'm out. So just clean it off and cover it up because staph infection is real, everybody. I'm here to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> I know. Any type of infection. Well, um, what about, you know, I guess I'm guilty of this. Um, you know, I sleep with the dogs. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, they love to cuddle up. They get in the bed. And, uh, um, of course, they're clean and the bed's clean. But I guess the same precautions go with that. I mean, um, right? <laughs> I was afraid you were going to say that. But, um, but yes, uh, a common question is, yes, can I still sleep with uh, my dog? And, you know, the official answer in most most places that you look on the Internet or um, transplant center uh, informational booklets will say try not to do that. Is it scientific? Not exactly. It just kind of makes sense to try not to have always uh, continuous exposure uh, for that, but uh, you know, it's worked out for you. You do take a lot of precautions, though, and you do uh, take great care of yourself and your pets. So that's probably why you've been fine all this time. But not everyone can tend to their pets uh, as as uh, well as as you do, and maybe for for them, especially early on after surgery, I probably wouldn't recommend sleeping with pets um, at least early on. Well, and, and the thing is, is that. The real thing is I would be sleeping on the floor, probably, not the dogs. <laughs> well, they just let us live here. That's what I tell me and my husband. You know, the animals just let us live here. Um, and I uh, I suggest that um, if I had real kids, um, I don't know what they're, where they would be because um, they're quite spoiled, our um, animals. So let's move along to cats because um, uh, are cats pretty much the same as dogs or do they have any other risks? There's there's some slightly different risks. Um, we can start off with the uh, the cat litter box, and uh, there are some risks associated with that. And uh, it's advised that someone else do the cleaning uh, for the cat. I'm all for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Most people don't don't complain about that. So, uh, but we do. There is science to that. There are some special infections that uh, cats can pass on. And uh, it's best to stay out of their litter box if at all possible. And if you do have to, of course, uh, wash your hands before and after, use gloves, and things of that nature. Well, and, uh, you know, I know one of my friends who had a transplant patient, she uh, she wore a mask and gloves when because she, she lived alone, and she just did it herself. She put a mask on and gloves and cleaned her own litter box, and she had a rabbit cage, and she cleaned that. And she just was extremely careful. Yep. Um, and, uh, but, um, you know, I've heard of something called cat scratch fever. And if a cat scratches you or bites you, um, you have to take care of that very, very quickly, right? Yes, that's right. Um, I think a cat scratch is a little different than a typical dog scratch. And yes, there is that, uh, cat uh, scratch fever and it should be tended to uh, pretty quickly. It could, um, you know, progress pretty quickly. So it's a good idea to, um, get medical care. And uh, you know, obviously clean the area, clean the wound if there is a, a, a deep wound, and then uh, antibiotics might be necessary as well. But, you, but you're right, that, that is a different scenario than a typical, uh, like a dog scratch or even a bite. So that, that, that's correct. So, and then if cats have like, you know, you hear of like feline leukemia or um, like any type of virus, um, is it just the same precautions because of the fact that it's just they have it. They can't really transfer that, right? I, I guess. I'm you're, you're right. You're right. They cannot uh, transfer it directly. Um, but uh, if they do have that, then their immune system could be lower, and then they could get other types of infection that could, in theory, be passed on uh, to someone. And, well, you know, one of the things that I did with um, – because I have a Maine Coon cat, and I had two cats. Um, one has since passed. Um, but I always make sure their nails were trimmed. I mean, they were indoor cats. Um, you know, it's not really a good thing to trim an outdoor cat's nails if because they can't protect themselves. But um, uh, my husband and I had a unplanned kitty um, when we went to the pet store, and they had two cats up from adoption from the local shelter. And they, um, 
you know, we didn't really plan on these kittens, but they won our hearts over. And they said we couldn't get one. We had to get two, of course, right? And they turned out to be Maine Coon cats. Um, they're wonderful. We have one still. But when they're kittens, I mean, they have sharp little teeth and sharp little um, uh, claws. And when you're on steroids, your skin is a little bit thin. So it's very, very easy to get bruised and punctured. So I'm, I was constantly carrying band-aids around and stuff like that and being cautious to keep them. But it, it's a little bit harder when you have a puppy uh, or a kitten because their, their teeth and their nails are so sharp. That's right, and which is uh, why it's best to kind of hold off on getting a puppy or a kitten, um, you know, soon uh, after transplant. But in terms of, you know, the, going back to cats, it's it's actually recommended not to be uh, not to declaw, of course, right. but to uh, trim the nails as, as best you can. Um, it, it is best to, to do that, and, you, and you've done that uh, through the years. Uh, back to cats, though, it's best that they remain mainly indoors if possible, because uh, outdoor cats, you know, have more risk of uh, acquiring infections or coming into contact with other things, and it's probably, if possible, better to have them uh, indoors. And I think. Many cats are indoors anyways. Well, they should be because if they're outdoors in California, they're coyote. Uh, <laughs> they're subject to having, you know, being hit by a car, coyotes. And, you know, it's really crazy around Glendale. We have a lot of owls in Glendale. And they will oh. pick up a kitten. They will pick up, I mean, you have to be careful. A little dog was picked up. Um, and, uh, you know, you and now we have bobcats running around. I'm like, oh, my goodness, it's becoming uh, wildlife. And, you know, we're a suburban area, too. So um, it's better for your cat to be inside anyways. And my husband and I took the uh, expense of building a habit trail out the side of our house. So our cats can go outside but be protected and not be exposed to other cats. <laughs> Uh, we're a little crazy. Um, before we wrap up, I want to just touch a little bit on reptiles and snakes and um, and I guess rabbits, the same thing, because rabbits are becoming more popular as pets and hamsters and gerbils and guinea pigs do the same things, apply, take care of them, have somebody else clean the cage, uh, just so we catch all kind of uh, animals you keep in the house. Yeah, the same uh, the same uh, principles apply uh, for, for um hamsters and, and things of, you know, pets like that. So let's touch a little bit on turtles and fish and iguanas because I think, uh, you know, people need to know what precautions they need to do with that type of animal. Great question. Actually, um, at least for the turtles, they are probably a little bit more higher risk in terms of animals, pets, than the other uh, pets that we discussed earlier. And again, for that, again, just good um, hand hygiene and trying not to obviously deal with any of their waste, um, but uh, typically the turtles do have a little bit higher risk for a salmonella in particular. Mm -hmm. So definitely want to just be be careful. But uh, I I've known people, and I think you have as well, that have cared for their turtles after transplant, and it went well. It went well, and I guess you just you know you have to be careful. You have to remember that you're immunocompromised and, you know, animals carry certain risks. And with fish, I mean, do you stick your hand in the fish tank? Um, is that dangerous? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be, actually. Uh, it uh, They try to, to advise you not to clean out the tank and have someone else do it. And But if you do, again, to take the typical uh, precautions that we talked about earlier in, in the session. But uh, I think you know and I know people that have taken care of their fish um, who had them before and after transplant and everything goes well. You know, it's, I hear so many stories of, you know, because most of my friends have animals, they've had ferrets, they've had everything, you know. And um, I just get so upset when I see people be, being told by their doctor that they need to give up their animals. And I, I want to, and I know, you know, it's a, it's a medical practice, different physicians practice differently, but what is something that a patient could tell their doctor or reason with their doctor to get them to, you know, we could have them listen to this podcast, but um, any advice for, um, you know, somebody who, who is going through this? Well, actually, yes, um, because in preparation for the session, I needed to brush up on a few topics myself. And uh, actually, the CDC has uh, a website, you know, within their website, they have this topic, uh, 
and they address uh, pets after transplant. So that's kind of a good starting point. I think um, the CDC, obviously being a, a national uh, entity and uh, authority on infections, and uh, they definitely don't. I didn't see anywhere that they said and advocated for removal of their their pets. But you're right. There is a lot of variability in terms of uh, physician or provider um, attitudes towards this topic. I just uh, googled this topic and you know looked at different uh, transplant centers across the country and what they, what they mentioned. And there's a little bit of variation on that. Um, I even had to look at mine. Uh, officially, our official policy, and luckily it lines up with what I've been saying all along, that we embrace uh, pets as part of family. Well, and maybe one of the things that somebody can do that's listening to the show is ask them to go back and reevaluate the policy um, and just get them to focus on it and do the research to update it. Um, and then, you know, if they're, if if you're in a situation where you're at multiple transplant centers, I mean, you can pick and go to another center, that has the, you know, in line with what you believe, because, uh, I mean, if I had to even consider giving my animals up, it would put me into such a depressive state um, that it would just make everything so much harder. So hopefully this will spark a discussion. And uh, Dr. V, thank you so much for, uh, you know, bringing up this topic because uh, and educating the public about it because, you know, it breaks my heart every time I see uh, somebody say that. And, um, you know, we'll bring up on another issue, you know, pets and dialysis. And, you know, I was on dialysis. I was on home hemo. I was on PD. And I don't know if you have any recommendations on dialysis, but... Um, it's pretty much probably would be the same if you are handling a pet, correct? Pretty much the same. Pretty much the same. Uh, there really isn't anything that's uh, special, at least in terms of recommendations of uh, dialysis versus uh, transplant. Again, general recommendations that we've talked about. And uh, again, you've followed those all over the years and you've done quite well. Well, and, you know, with peritoneal, you don't, like, have the cat sitting on your cycler when you're making an exchange. I mean, you keep the animals Probably out not. and stuff like that. I mean, I'm like, okay, you guys, you know, you got to remove the animal from the area where you're doing the exchange. So, and, and there's different things that makes it a little bit more steps you have to take. But it's all doable, and pets have saved my life. So thank you so much, and uh, I'll probably see you at a animal rescue soon. You will. Great talking to you. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.